with me to Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is one of the best books, greatest books that I know of. They're all great, but Ephesians has truth in it that Paul couldn't tell nobody else until it was time. He told the second Corinthians, he told them, said, I will speak the truth, but I forbear. Now, he couldn't do it. He heard unspeakable words when he was called up. And I believe he wrote them down in the book of Ephesians and Colossians. And so, anyway, Ephesians chapter 1. And what I want to do is, well, verse 9. Have been made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. And verse 9 is his purpose. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Uh, look with me. Notice he said in heaven and earth, Look over in chapter 3. In chapter 3, in verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You can't search what he's going to tell you out. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent. Now that word intent is his purpose, aim. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's the characters is up there. Uh, Kevin went through all of them. He said unto the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known now, he's going to tell you what they they're want to get to know. In heaven it might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, all of those heavenly creatures up there, the principalities and powers, you're teaching them something. You're making known to them what is that wisdom of God that was hid in God before the foundation of the world. Not wrote down. Nobody knew about it. And if somebody says they can go back there and show the church and all this, and the old time, they're, they're, you can't do it. It's unsearchable, and it's his purpose. And verse 10 of chapter 1 tells you that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. And I will talk to you about being in Christ. Now you're either in Christ or you're not. There's no middle ground. You're not halfway in Christ.
Christ, and when you learn some more, you'll get further in Christ. Right now, you're either in Christ or you're not. And only you know that. I can't look at you and tell you whether you're saved or not. You say, well, you look at their life. No, you can't look at their life. It's not about what they do, what they don't do. It's about what's in their heart. It's about what they're trusting in. So you can't tell whether I'm saved. I can't tell whether you're saved. But you know in your heart whether you're saved or not. You know whether you're in Christ or not. Now I want to talk to you about being in Christ, but before I do that, notice in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And he goes through this again about the creation in verse 16. Verse 17, He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead. People say, well, who... When did the church begin? It began with Christ in His resurrection. The first, who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead. That in all things He might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. Now verse 20 is my verse. And having made peace through the blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There are two spheres up there. There's earth, heaven. There are two different inheritances. There are actually three inheritance up uh, in the Bible, but I'm just concerned with heaven and earth being in Christ. Now look with me about this. I want you to turn with me and look in, uh, let's go to, uh, let's see, Romans. Now there's some verses that people don't understand. But notice in Romans chapter 16. Romans 16, verse 7. Romans 16, verse 7. Salute Andronicus and Junior, my kinsmen, my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who were in Christ before Paul. And people say, okay, there's somebody that's in Christ before Paul. Paul's not the first to be in Christ. See, that's where they messed up. Paul's the first to be in the body of Christ, but he's not the first in Christ. Look with me in Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And notice in Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Now he'd been saved over three years and he hadn't even talked to Peter or none of them. But other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. <clears throat> so he didn't, he saw Peter, he saw James. <clears throat> Verse 21. And afterwards, I came to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. 
and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were, what? In Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And what was he trying to destroy? He was trying to destroy the name of Jesus. He was trying to destroy that Jesus was the Son of God. He tried to destroy the gospel of uh, God. That God had raised Jesus up from the dead. And Paul was mad against the churches there. But my point is, were they in Christ? They sure was. But them churches that are in Christ before Paul is not the body of Christ. Now look with me again. Now let's try the thing. Turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Just going to go down through there. Notice in verse 1. I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit. He taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit. He purgeth it. In, and that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the words which I have spoken unto you. Verse 4. What's the first three words? Abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that, what? Abideth in me. Verse 7. If ye abide in me. Verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments. Look with me over in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Notice in verse 21. Now they all may be one. He's talking about, go back with me in the verse up there, in verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, the twelve's word. So the twelve preached, people got saved, they're churches of Judea. Right or wrong? And they're in Christ. And they are to abide in Christ. But you notice it's they got to abide in Christ. They got to keep His commandments. You are sealed. And they ain't got nothing to do with you abiding. You follow? We'll look at that in a moment. But they said through their word, verse 21, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in who? Us. The Son, the Father, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me and the glory which Thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one. I, where? In them. And Thou in me that they may be perfect in one that the world may know that Thou hast sent me and hast loved them as Thou hast loved me. And there ain't no doubt, uh, I, there's no, no go on, they get the earth. They're going to have the earth. And they're going to have, they've got a hope. And that hope, look with me in Let's go to Peter. And notice in 1 Peter, their hope. 
Therein they abide in Christ. They abide in Christ. They stand in Christ. Well, how they do that? Well, look in 1 Peter and notice in chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter, no, go to chapter, yeah, 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us. Now you see that word, us? And Peter didn't say me, us. That's a national thing. They're born again. You understand? The nation Israel in that new nation, in that flock, were born again. Okay, now look what he said. Hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Their salvation will be revealed at the second coming of Christ. Now I hope you see, he said they have an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. The people he's writing to. Who's he writing to? Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, all of the places out there where the Jews were scattered upon the persecution that Saul made against the church. And the Bible said they went everywhere preaching the word to none but the Jews only in Acts chapter 11. And Peter writes to them and tells them they got an inheritance. I want you to see that. Look in Hebrews. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter, what is that inheritance? Notice in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is reserved in heaven for them. Now you remember Jesus, I don't have time to go through all the verses, but do you remember in Matthew 24, Jesus said, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Hebrews is about people falling away. Hebrews is wrote to Hebrews during that tribulation period and they, they're going to have to, they can't take the mark of the beast or they'll fall away. And if they fall away, it's impossible to renew them again under repentance. They're gone. They're like Esau who sold their his birthright for some bowl of beans, peas, whatever. And he counted it of none effect. And the Bible said that he sought it with tears. Look, look with me here in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Well, notice, notice in verse, I'm going to read about it. He talking about in verse 14. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And that's a spiritual thing there, what that he did. And notice he said in verse 17, For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. And the Jew in Hebrew, in that tribulation, that seized the thing, seized the, tasted the Word of God, and was made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and goes on and turns and 
as though he sells his birthright, takes the mark of the beast, he will be like Esau. He'll saw, though he saw it with tears, how that afterward, verse 17, he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he saw it carefully with tears. For ye are not come unto Mount Zion that might be touched, and that burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. In other words, there around that mount, God comes down that mount to talk to Moses, and they hear the voice of God. They see Him come down. They don't see Him, but they see all of that glory come to the top of that mountain. And they sat there and they feared and they trembled. Even Moses said, notice what he said in verse 20, For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned and thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. I mean, he's shaking in his boots. That's God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You think, you think he'd be up there chewing his gum and popping jokes and everything? No, no, no. He's going before the creator of heaven and earth. He's up there. And God is going to talk to him. Now look what he said. Verse 22. But ye are come. You're not come unto that mount. That mount was the law. That mount you couldn't do nothing with. That mount would demand death to you. The law is, would bring curses on you. People want to keep the law today. Well, you can't keep the law today for your salvation. The law would demand your perfection and you don't have it. But look what he said. He said, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Well, that's not the body of Christ. Just because the word church is there, word church is assembly. And he said to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, the church of the firstborn is the general assembly that's going to be in that city. Now look what he said. And to the God, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Now notice what this had come unto this city, heavenly Jerusalem. Turn to Revelation and look in Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Verse 9. Revelation chapter 21 verse 9. In verse 9 he says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now what do you think he's going to expect to see? The bride, wouldn't you? Look what he said. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. Uh, high, that would be like a kingdom. And, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven. 
Where is it preserved, Peter said? In heaven. Thou John sees it coming down, descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God and her light was the light unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a great a wall, great and high, had twelve gates, and at the twelve gates twelve angels, and the names written there on were the names of the body of Christ. No. The names of the twelve tribes of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of who? Twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now he's seeing the great city. What's he looking at? He's looking at the bride of Christ. Somebody say, what's the bride? New Jerusalem. And the people that's in it. Now look at this. Why are you there? Go back to verse chapter 20, verse 6. In verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So they're priests. Now turn back to Peter. I should have told you to hang on to Peter. But look in, back in Peter chapter uh, Second Peter. No, go to second chapter of First Peter. <clears throat> and notice in <clears throat> Peter, verse uh, second chapter, verse nine. Well, I'll tell you what, go down to verse five. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. A holy what? So that they're a priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Come to verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal, there it is again, isn't it? Priesthood and holy. Are they a nation? Yes a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Now I want you to go back to Matthew. And I want you to look in Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 21. In Matthew 21... You remember Jesus said, I'm the true vine. Ye are the branches. In verse 33, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged around about and digged a wine press in it, built a tire and let it out to the husbandman and went into a far country. Goes after, goes in the, back in, sends into heaven. Come down with me to verse 37. <clears throat> uh, they killed their servants, verse 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they sat among themselves. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us see on his inheritance. And they called him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord of, therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard kingdom unto other husbandmen, 
which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the Scripture the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now watch verse 43. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, given and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. He would look back in with me about the thing. And he'd go forth and... Verse 34, And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants uh, to the husbandmen and they, that they might receive the fruits of it. There was no fruit. They wouldn't give it. They killed him. And that nation is going to bring forth the fruits. Now he's quoting Isaiah chapter 5. Look back with me just for a moment to Isaiah chapter 5. That parable come right out of there. Uh, the Lord used Isaiah chapter 5. Notice in verse 1. And I'm not going to read all of it, but verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof. He planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. When Jesus showed up, those people, the ones that were supposed to be the husbandmen, they were supposed to be the ones that would accept Christ. They brought forth wild grapes. They rejected Him. Come down with me and look verse 4. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Therefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought forth wild grapes. Uh, go now, uh, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. Break down the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And it's trodden down of the Gentiles, and it was destroyed, and boom. God just about wiped the plum off the map. Now y'all understand what's going on here? He's here. Now look in verse 7, uh, verse 6. And I will lay it waste. He did. And it shall be pr pruned and digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. You got a lot of briars and thorns over there in that land today. You got put things, people saying they're Jews and they're not. They'll be tried by the true remnant in the trib. That's what them seven churches is about. That's some of the things that's going to happen. Look what he said. Briars and thorns, and I will command the clouds that they rain no more. Uh, they rain no more rain upon it. Now watch verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. Where did Jesus come from? Come out of Judah. He's the true vine. Now there is a bramble, according to Judges, that's going to come up. That bramble is the Antichrist. And they'll bow down to him. But they won't bow, didn't bow down to Jesus. But when he comes out of the, as the line of Judah, they can't do much with that line. You, you, I hope I'm not boring you here. The vineyard of the Lord is the a host is the house of Israel. The men of Judah, his pleasant plant, and he looked for judgment, but behold oppression; for righteousness, but behold a cry. Now, folks, 
That's what Jesus is talking about. Now look back in Matthew 21 again. He said, therefore I say unto you. He's talking about the builders. He's talking about the vineyard. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now notice verse uh, 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard the parables, they perceived that he spake to them. Well, look who the nation is. Turn over to Luke. Look in Luke. In Luke chapter 12. Notice what he says in verse 31. Fear not, uh, verse 31, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, sell that you have. Who gets the kingdom? The little flock. The little flock is the nation that's going to bring forth the fruit, and they did. Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, and 5,000 were saved. He preaches again, 3,000 get saved. They're bringing forth the fruits of that kingdom, of the vineyard, the grapes of the Lord. That thing's going on. They're a nation there. They're the new nation of Israel. And they're born again. Acts chapter 2 is the birthday of the new nation. Not the body of Christ. And they're in Christ. They're the ones that's going to bring the earth back under His domain. Under and he'll rule the earth through the nation Israel. Well, what about the heavens? The new heavens. You know, let me say this, and I've jotted this down. They must endure, they must abide, they must overcome. They're caught. He that overcometh. They got to endure to the end. They got to, they can't fail. They can't fall from the grace of God. They can, God give them grace and He give them power. They can't turn their back on the Lord. You know what will happen? They're gone. Never to be. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. What about you? You're in Christ. Notice in verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. It's like the down payment of our inheritance. It's the assurance. The Holy Spirit, God gave you of His Spirit as assurance that you're going to get an inheritance out there. Well, where is your inheritance? It's not in that city. You ain't come unto Mount Zion, the city. Where is your inheritance? Well, look in chapter 1 of Ephesians. Come down with me to verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand? Where? In heavenly places. Jesus is sitting in heavenly places right now. 
And notice far above all principality and power and might, dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Come over to chapter 2. In chapter 2, Notice what he said in verse 5, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together, where? In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. You're in heaven. You're going to be seated in Christ, in heavenly places. Out there, not on the earth. I mean, we we gonna be out there with God's original creation, and you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna be reigning with Him. There are three things. Notice, turn. We look in chapter verse ten. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We're a new creation in Christ. We're, God is creating the body of Christ. Never heard of that. To fill the heavens out there with people that He saved by grace, and we're showing forth the wisdom of God and His eternal purpose to all the angels, and someday we'll show forth His purpose and grace to all of His creation. We are not, we're created in Christ, and we're sealed in Him. You say, what if I quit believing? Well, look over in 2 Timothy. And I'm going to close. In 2 Timothy, notice what he says here. Verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. And he's talking about reigning. Now notice what he says. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. And you are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. You're in a spiritual body that is as much a living organism as your natural body right now. And you're a member of that. And he denies you, he'd have to deny himself. We're a new creature, a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things has passed away, and behold, all things has become new. Now there are several other things that I was going to mention, but I'm not. I might mention them next week. There's, I could make this a, I could make it a three-parter, but I won't. I think I'll finish it next week. You don't want to miss next week because I'm just liable to say something profound. <laughs> And you don't want to hear about it. So I'm looking around seeing everybody that's here. Now I realize that some people have to work or sick or other things that's necessary. But if you are not sick, if you're not working, and don't go out in the yard and pick up a stick and say you had to work. I expect you to be here next Sunday. Because I'm telling you, you'll find out what you are in Christ. All right? Let's stand.